Today's reading is from John 6, 16 through 21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The scene became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. When they were glad to take then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Good morning to one and all. So glad you all are here. My name is Andrew. I'm one of the pastors at Neartown Church, and I really want to thank you, the local spring breakers who did not leave like everyone else, uh, because it's apparent we're like missing half of our people. But that's okay, because I trust all those people are joining us online. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that we also have a team that is right now in London. And the reason I'm certain of that is because my wife is leading that trip. And so uh, it's kind of exciting. I get I get picture updates. I would share them because, but my phone's doing weird things. Uh, it looks like they're all having a lovely time. If you think of our team in uh, London right now, please pray for them. Uh, we are all are missing Colby, but Emily and Alex and the rest of the band are doing an incredible job. So if you, yes, they are exactly. So now band who you cannot hear us. We love you. We love you. We love you. Um, In your seat is a connect card. I want to draw your attention to it for two reasons. One, just like David said, if this is your first time or You've been a few times and you have never filled that out. Please, please, please fill out that connect card. You can do so by hand and then turn it in in the black box in the back. You can also, also just scan that QR code and then fill it out digitally on your phone. The second reason is I want to draw your attention to the today's sermon notes spot. If you scan that, you can also follow along with what I will be preaching through today. And uh, if for any reason you can't see the photos uh, on the screen next to me, uh, you can see them, all right? So you have joined us. You have joined us Uh, in the middle of our series, unbelievable, right? We are going through the eight miracles that we see in John's gospel. Now we're going to be interacting with each of these miracles to see if we have moved from the apathetic shoulder shrug kind of, uh, that's unbelievable, uh, and then move towards the right-hand side on this continuum towards passion, where it's, it's remarkable. It's exceptional, right? So it, on this left side, apathy, oh, whatever, it's unbelievable. But on the right side with passion, passion for who God is and what he is doing, we are saying that's, that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. And we are, you know, exclaiming with joy. So as we're going through this series in John, we're going to see, is God moving us more and more to where we are being confronted in belief on who Jesus really is? Now, You are joining us, if this is your first time, we are in the middle of a series, right? So we are in the middle of a series. And the funny thing is, as far as John's gospel is concerned, this miracle is actually in the middle of a story, right? So last week, Pastor Russell uh, covered the feeding of the 5,000. And if you remember, it says 5,000 men. And it wasn't just a a dude's fest. Um, The ladies and the kids were with him, them. So that's actually probably about 15 to 20,000 people were there. Uh, they, they all ate their fill from five loaves and two fish. And they were so excited because this guy can do miracles. And now we are filled. So what's going to happen? So we're going to catch the last few verses from last week. So John six fourteen. when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So why is Jesus wanting to get away? Why did he want to withdraw? Is it just because they wanted to make him king? All right. So when we ask questions like this, if we have a question in scripture, 
I can do this. You can do this. When you when you're reading a passage, it's really helpful to see what came before it. Right? Sometimes the questions that you have are either answered in the few verses or the few stories ahead of it, or maybe the answers are coming. Right? So like when your kids ask you when you're watching a movie, why is this happening? Why is this happening? You say, just just keep watching. I promise you, they're going to answer the question, all right? So sometimes when you're in scripture, the question may be answered, but I wanted to say what's fun about the gospels is when you have a question about what's happening, there is likely another place in the gospels that are talking about the exact same story. So here is a chart which which is going to cover what we see across the four gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called the synoptic gospels. As you can see, for the most part, they have most of the same things. All right. So, uh, and then John, he's got one of the same things and then two of the, but then he, he doesn't have what's going before. So if you're in John and you have a question, maybe go and look at one of the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, or Luke. What has happened before this? All right. So Jesus was rejected at Nazareth. The people from his hometown who should have loved him so and knew who he was, they rejected him. And then he sends out the 12. He takes the disciples and says, now go and do ministry. And so they go out two by two and they go and they actually perform miracles all throughout the surrounding areas. And then they get word that John the Baptist has been killed. And Herod killed John the Baptist. Note John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, all right? So he has been rejected. He has sent his disciples out to go and do miracles and healings, and they've done them. Hooray, yay, hi, happy feeling. And then John the Baptist has been killed. They find out about it. And so it says Jesus and the gang went to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. So here is a map that I want us to kind of get put, this is the first map. So down here on the Southwest side of this uh, is Nazareth. This is where Jesus is from. When he sends the 12 out to the surrounding areas, it's probably the areas that are in between here and Capernaum or Cana, which was up here. We talked about that the other week, but this here, this body of water is the Sea of Galilee. Natasha, if you can send it to the next image, this is where Jesus goes. All right. So they Go over here to the feeding of the 5,000. This is the less populated side of Galilee. Again, what's going on? He's been rejected. The high high of the, the 12 disciples actually doing the healings and the miracles and then finding out about John. He's wanting to get away from all that they were doing to rest, to process these things. And what happens? Everybody says, what's going on? Jesus is here. Let's go see him. And then they all run and they follow him over there. Now, before we move on, I do want to say thank you to the people at holylandsite.com because these great photos are all from them. So the best thing you can do is find people who have done good work and utilize it and just make sure you cite it. Okay. Um, So, I'm not going to re-preach Russell's message from last week on the feeding of the 5,000. If you missed it, we do have a YouTube channel. So go check that out. You can, you can see, I, I really tried. Russell, if you're watching this, I tried my hardest to find an image that was like, like strong and exciting. Um, but go and check this out on YouTubes. All right, so Jesus feeds about 15 to 20,000 individuals that he really wasn't, he was trying to get away and they all followed and his heart went out to them and he fed them, right? And now with their bellies full, they want to come and take Jesus and they say, we want you to be our revolutionary ruler. And they're about to take him. He says, no, I actually have my own plan. I know what you want. It's not my plan, all right? So Jesus sends the disciples away then Jesus also sends the people away and then he scats, all right? So this image here is going to show kind of the, the separation of where these things were. So feeds over here in the flats, he escapes up to the mountains. 
He goes there to pray and be alone. He sends the disciples to the beach to say, okay, you go, All right? And this is where we're joining up with this story, All right? So verse 16, when evening came, his disciples had not, I'm sorry, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat and started to cross the sea to Capernaum. Now, when you get to read the different passages of scripture, this one says they're going to Capernaum. Another one says they're going to Bethsaida. But if you look at this map from the the vantage point of the shore, looking west, next one, they're here. You can see that Capernaum and Bethsaida really aren't that far apart. So if somebody is going to read this and they're going to compare the stories and kind of freak out, it says two different things. They're close. They're close. So this is where Jesus says to go. Let's go back to the passage, verse 17. Okay, so it was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit pause right here. So utilizing what we saw on that chart and looking at the other passages, Matthew and Mark say at about the time this is happening is about the 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. range, all right? So it's not just dark. <laughs> it's dark, dark. It is the absolute darkest. It is going to be at night. The disciples are in their boat and they are rowing. It is not going really well. Different passages are going to highlight the fact that it's like a storm. It, it, the winds are blowing. The waves are making it very difficult. It says that the, it says the disciples are not making much headway. All right. So what we do know is they are three to four miles out. So when we look at a map like, or picture like this, it's going to show, okay, they did the feeding of the 5,000. That's on this shore. Oh, look there, you know, miracle location right out in the water. Like that doesn't seem all that far, but let's go back to the map that has the overhead view. The miracle location is like dead center. All right. So three to four miles out, this is eight miles across. This is eight miles across. So they have been working all night. They have been rowing and rowing and rowing, and all they have done is successfully gotten to the middle of the Sea of Galilee. So they are now perfectly fine to be away from absolutely everything. They are the farthest they can be from all of the shores, and this is where they have arrived. Now, I want I want to take a step away from the text. Our, our text here, it's five verses. Even comparing the other passages, it doesn't really provide a lot of other information. And one of the things I want us to do is just pause and say, what might the disciples have been thinking? Now, I, I, I'm hesitant in doing this because I don't want to project all of what's going on in my head and what I might be feeling at about this time. But I think it might be safe for us to pause and just ask the questions. What might they be feeling? Okay, so imagine you have just watched your teacher, the teacher that you have dedicated your life to, not just to say, I like their YouTube videos, but instead going after them all over the countryside, leaving home and family and saying, I want to be about this rabbi. And when you go with him to his hometown, he is rejected. He's rejected by the people who should have known, should have trusted, should have liked him, at least been more willing to say, yeah, he really is the Messiah. He's not little, not just little Joseph or little Jesus, but he's the Messiah. These people, the ones who should have known better, they rejected him. That seems like a low, low, right? They go from there and Jesus then sends them out to do the healing. So now you're a disciple. You have been on the learning side, right? You have been listening and you have been taking. And now Jesus says, go. I want you to do what I've been doing. So they go out in twos and they go and they heal people, right? You're a disciple who's been in learning mode and now you are in doing mode. You're not just in doing mode. 
somebody who was sick in front of you, you told them, be healed in the name of Jesus, and they were, (laughs) right? And so at the first group of people, you can't understand, how didn't they know that he was the Messiah? This man who then sent you out, you were able to heal people in his name, through his power. He's got to be the Messiah, right? And then you hit get hit with the news that John the Baptist is dead. John the Baptist, who was out baptizing, he has his own disciples. He's been killed. He's been killed. He's been pointing to the Messiah. If John was beheaded because he was telling the truth, what's that mean for us? What's going to happen to us because we're about this Messiah? And then in your weary state, Jesus does this crazy miracle. All these people flock. You watch. 15 to 20,000 people eat. And now Jesus says, go on to the other side. I'll see you over there. And so the Messiah, the one that you are trusting in, the one that you are trying to lean on, the one that you are still trying to figure out who he really is. I mean, like what's the full scope? How might you feel when you are in the middle of the water and you have been rowing and rowing and rowing all night and you are tired and you haven't actually processed all of this and no matter how hard you try, it just isn't happening. How would you feel? I might feel like this, right? <laughs> like this is me, Kermit as the screaming emoji, that is me or screaming gif, okay? Okay. I would love to watch Kermit all the time. Um, but that is all that I came up to in my mind when I was thinking about how the, the disciples might be processing this. Because they haven't really had time to process this and nothing is going well. Okay, keep that image. Not in you, Natasha, but we uh, let's keep that image of Kermit screaming, right? The ah. I'm pretty sure that all that we have walked through, that the disciples are going through, what Jesus is going through, I'm certain that no one in this room or watching online is in that exact same scenario, right? But can I wager a guess that some of you might actually feel that you are in a similar emotional spinner where all at once you are having these levels of joy with pain, confusion, happiness, anger, right? It's all there at once. It's a both and. The high highs and the low lows. And you feel like you are in this emotional spinner. And you're saying, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? So what if, hear me out, What if this state, this emotional spinner is where God's presence and his power are going to be the clearest for you? What if this state is where you can see him clearest? Now, I I do want to pause and say, I am hesitant to say this emotional spinner like with all of the uh, the highs and the lows, this is where God wants you. And I know that we as preacher types and Jesus loving people have said that, but I don't want to because you might be experiencing the loss of a loved one or someone who is about to pass. You, you might be looking at the loss of a career. You might be looking at even the loss of your own health. And so I don't want to say This is where God wants you so that you hear God made me miserable and he's happy that things are awful right now for me, right? I don't, I don't want to make that connection because that's not really true. God is not rejoicing at our suffering. He is not indifferent to our pain. And I wanted to take a moment. The Bible is very clear that God cares about us when he is present with us and he cares about what we are going through, right? So before Christmas, we talked a great deal about Emmanuel coming, God with us. The author Matthew repeats it. Matthew chapter 1, 22 and 23, all of this, the birth of Jesus, how it went, all of it took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. 
God is present. He is not absent. Jesus' arrival here on earth, it was proof that God is with us. But it's, it's more than that one theme pulled between Isaiah and Matthew. John 14, 16 and 17, Jesus is talking. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. God promises the Holy Spirit to those of us who are in him. So the Holy Spirit is with you currently, presently, right now. Psalm 56, eight through 11, you have kept count of my tossings. You've put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? And then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? The reminder of God's intimate present presence. Matthew 28, 20, B. Right at the end of the Great Commission, he tells us I am with you always to the end of the age. A reminder, he hasn't left. He is here. He is with you. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 31, 6 and 8, he says it multiple times. And then they repeat it in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So I I want to try to paint a picture, right? I, I want to take you all the way through those passages to say, God is here. God is with you. God is near you in your pain and he shares in it. So he's here and it's good. And He sees. However, on the other hand, God also works within our situations to bring himself the glory, right? To bring the awe factor out to truly show everyone who he is and what he has done. Peace is a person. Peace is present. Jesus is peace. So I want us to hold that in our minds, this this tension as we jump back into the story, okay? Verse 19. When the disciples had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. Okay, four miles from either shore, and there's Jesus walking on a surface that cannot be walked on. At least that was all of their experience prior. It's been mine too, I've tried. Um, My favorite nugget, my first favorite nugget about this story. It actually comes from the gospel of Mark and it just kind of throws it in there real quietly. It says, Jesus meant to pass them by. Jesus meant to pass them by. They are on the water. The waves and the wind are crazy. Jesus is walking. He was just being miraculous because he was God right? He wasn't wasn't trying to be miraculous. He wasn't trying like, I'm going to go do this thing. And now the disciples are going to see, and it's going to be awesome. No, Jesus is just Jesus. He kind of meant to pass by them. I don't know how fun that is, but I think it's amazing that Jesus just was like, yeah, I'm, I'm walking these eight miles across this totally normal path on water. Okay. Regardless of the intent, he was seen walking on the water. So as the disciples have recounted, they were on the edge emotionally, right? So I'm not sure how a normal person, you, I, would react to somebody walking by us on the water. Um, I think I would freak out. So now let's add that emotional heightened state of the disciples. They are really freaking out. And they see him and they don't know what to do. Okay. I'm going to change the vantage point from the disciples towards Jesus. You ever have it when, when you get home really, really late and there are people in the house. So you, you arrive, you try to key in as quiet as you can. You try to sneak through 
in the dark and not hit everything that you can't see because all the lights are out. And inevitably, you get near someone and you do, you bump something, you, you make a noise. And you, what do you do? What do you say after you have hit the noise and you hear stirring? What comes out of your mouth? Don't worry. Hey, it's me. It's me. Don't worry. And what does Jesus say to them? Verse 20. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Jesus knows what they are feeling. He knows how they are freaking out. And he meets them right in their fear. And he speaks peace to them. It is I. Do not be afraid. I'm not a ghost. I'm your rabbi. I'm your Lord. It is I. Do not be afraid. However, I do, can, can, you, can you just join with me just for a little more nerdery? Hooray. Okay. When translating the Greek phrase that exists, ego a me, me phobiste, me phobiste, uh, it is accurate to translate this phrase as it is, it is I, do not be afraid. However, these four Greek words, can actually be translated directly into four words. And it is, I am, go back to the Greek word, I am, fear not. I am, fear not. I want to expand it just a little bit, right? So, ego, a, me, me, bobise. I know that's not rolling off your tongue. That's okay. It doesn't need to, but let's expand. Ego a me. Where have we seen that? Well, in Exodus 3, 6, where God appears to Moses at the burning bush and Moses is freaking out and God says, go back to Egypt, free my people. Moses says to God, who do I tell them sent me? Who sent me? Ego a me. That's how it's translated in the Septuagint. That is the Old Testament translation into Greek. Ego a me. I am sent you. I am. Okay, where else do we see this? John chapter 8, verse 58. When the Pharisees are arguing with Jesus about whose authority he has and who he is, he tells them, Before Abraham was, ego a me. Before, a, before Abraham was, I am. Okay. We see it again. John chapter 18, verses five and six. Soldiers show up with Judas. They are there. They are going to arrest Jesus. Jesus says, who are you here to arrest? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he, he responds, ego a me. I am. And if you go and we read that, when he says, ego a me, everybody falls back, falls to the ground, and then has to try to get back up. And Jesus tells them again, ego a me, I am the one you are looking for. I am. And then when we're looking here in John 6, 20, he's walking in the water. It's the midst of the storm. They're tired. They're worn down. They're feeling like they might be at wit's end. Ego a me. May Phobiste, the great I am is here. The great I am is here. The God over all creation who is not limited by gravity, water properties, or weather patterns. I am with you. And because peace is standing in front of you right here on the water, do not be afraid. I am. Fear not. Now, I mentioned Jesus intended to walk by them. That was my first favorite tidbit. My second favorite tidbit comes from this last verse. Verse 21. And then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land which they were going. When we read it quickly, sometimes we don't pick up on these things. John is the only one to record this, right? As Jesus gets into the boat, 
They're happy that he got in the boat and all of a sudden they are at land. The last time we looked at our map, they were four miles away. It had taken them all night just to get to the middle of nowhere. And Jesus shows up, they blink, and the creator of all creation gets them to the other side. I don't know why he did it. It's fun to kind of imagine why he did it. I can't answer the why. The text doesn't answer why, but in a blink, the God of all creation gets in the boat with them. They have worked all night to get four miles and he arrives and they arrive four miles away where they are going. I am, fear not. He speaks these words to them. Last week, uh, I got an email. I'm on an email list from the artist, Scott Erickson. And he shared this piece. I didn't think that we could find a perfect image for our story. I was wrong. In this image, you have a boat. You have the oars. You have the water. And all of that is contained in two hands. Two cupped hands. This image is called Sabbath rest. But this is an incredible reminder that we are always within God's care. Whatever we are experiencing, those high highs, those low lows, no matter what we are going through, no matter how hard we are rowing and we're not getting anywhere, no matter if we have the the best thing that's ever happened in our life or the worst and we have nowhere to turn, this image from Scott Erickson reminds us that we are never outside of God's care. He has us in his hands. He sees us. And what does he tell us? I am. Fear not. I am. Fear not. John wrote this book to drive us from that shoulder shrug, apathetic, arms crossed, unbelievable, to a jaw-dropping, passionate, unbelievable, to drive us to belief in the God of all creation who came in human form to show us that we are in need of that Savior. That Savior's name is Jesus. And life is available only in him through repentance. Jesus saves, not us. I am, fear not. So here is the call to action today. It's twofold. Twofold. Keep that, that phrase, I am, fear not. I am, fear not. Keep that in your head because what situation do you need to remember that peace incarnate, Jesus himself, the great I am, is with you? I am. I want you to take time today and just write the situation down. Where do I need to remember that I am is with me? But notice, Jesus doesn't just say to them, I am. Ta-da! There is a Second action that is a response to the first. I am. Fear not. If there is a situation, if you are able to come up with one, that you need to remember that the great I am is with you, that Jesus has come. He is making all things new, including you. If this is true, fear not. So if you came up with that situation, your second action, your response this week is spend time in prayer and ask God to bring that peace to that situation. So that as the fear and the frightenedness state that you feel is happening inside, you can turn it over to Jesus and say, I can be at peace because you are here. I am, fear not. 
So come up with the situation, look at your life, what is happening. You need to remember that I am is here. And the second thing is spend some time praying about it. Ask God to actually come and bring that peaceful presence. That's a call to action. Would y'all bow your heads with me as the band comes up? Lord, I thank you so much that you are moving and speaking in us. Open our hearts to where we actually might need to remember that you are present and that in your presence, we do not need to fear. Thank you, Lord, for the moments that we are going to have to pray and listen to you as David leads us in our time of response.